Uh, my name is Shatai Britman. I'm speaking to you here from uh, Agassiz, British Columbia. And uh, I was asked to speak uh, uh, on the subject of uh, wintertime nitrogen losses, and I wanted to acknowledge my uh, uh, co-worker over many years, Derek Hunt, uh, who is busy uh, doing some of the research right now outside while the sun is shining, and, uh, and I'm not helping him, so he's probably really mad at me right now. So uh, I'm going to start off uh, just by uh, talking about this uh, uh, rather simple but uh, yet deceptively not so simple uh, model, uh, which is sometimes re referred to as a leaky pipe model, and it can be applied to a field or a farm. And what it shows is, again, in, in, it's, it's, it's rather simple in a way, uh, going into the pipe, which is the field, uh, let's say uh, you have fertilizer, manure, uh, nitrogen, or nutrients. And on the other hand, you have the production, which is what you remove in the, in the, in the, in the way of a crop. And so uh, there's a couple of points to be made here. One is that uh, in the transfer of the nutrients from when you apply to the field to when you take them off, uh, uh, take it off as a crop, uh, there are leaks along the way, and you uh, stand uh, a, a certain risk of losing um, nut uh, nutrients by uh, ammonia volatilization if it's manure or urea fertilizer. Uh, there could be denitrification if, if the field is wet in particular. Uh, you can uh, also experience losses by uh, leaching and runoff. Uh, I heard some of I saw some of Dan slides on the runoff of phosphorus. So, um, so you're trying to minimize those uh, those leaks while you're going through, and uh, then you hope that most of the nutrients will wind up on the production side. And if you have the leaks, and they won't. Uh, but there's another way uh, also to look at this, and that is that if your production uh, doesn't uh, match uh, your fertilizer, if it if it's less than what your inputs are, then you will have leaks. The leaks will happen. You, um, you, they may not happen in one way, or they, then they'll happen another way. And then under those conditions, if you suppress one leak, you'll probably get an increased leak somewhere else. So let's say you put your finger over that hole that says ammonia because you're applying a manure now with a low emission application technique. Well, uh, you will likely get some more nutrient loss by leaching the runoff as long as you don't uh, remove as long as your, your production, your removal is, in, is not, does not match your inputs. So um, this is kind of simple uh, in concept, but uh, really difficult to implement in reality. So here's one of the reasons why this is difficult. This, this is a set of data we, uh, from a trial we did a number of years ago. And we uh, have three different years in the same field, and it shows uh, quite different uh, nitrogen responses uh, amongst the years. So the first year, uh, 1989, the nitrogen response was quite limited, whereas 1991, the nitrogen response was, was there. So um, if you don't know, and often you don't know uh, what, your what your crop response will be, then uh, depending on uh, what you guess and how much nitrogen you put on, in a year like 1989 or a crop like 1989, a lot of that nitrogen would be left over. Whereas um, if you applied less in the year uh, 1991, you would have uh, not had your best uh, uh, yield, the best crop that you might have had. So um, this is difficult to know. Uh, there's a lot of work ongoing in, in a number of different uh, ways to try to uh, come up with better predictions. Part of it is uh, trying to understand how much nitrogen the soil will min mineralize. But another very simple uh, or a very somewhat obvious reason for the, for the problem is that we actually don't know what the weather will do. However, we do know uh, something about the field and how productive it is, and we know how good the stand is, so we have at least some indication about uh, uh, what um, our crop response will be. So if it's, a, if it's an older stand and it's weedy, then obviously the less nitrogen uh, should go on, and if, it's, if you don't stick to that, then you wind up with a situation where you get the leaks coming out the sides because your production doesn't need that, but it doesn't match with your fertilizer inputs. So uh, we did uh, a long-term study uh, with Ari Slurry. Um, this is just a, a part of the results, and it's still ongoing. This is uh, data that is uh, it's more than 10 years old now, uh, but we have been checking it along the way, and and it's it's uh, checking out in the same way. I just haven't uh, we haven't put all the data together yet. That's an ongoing project to do that. But what we are able to show here is that um, uh, this is a good stand of uh, tall fescue, and uh, 
the amount of uh, nitrogen that we put on in terms of uh, the percent of the apply that's recovered, uh, we see that uh, something like uh, 60% at the high rate of fertilizer, which is 400 kilograms per hectare, four cuts of grass, uh, 100 uh, uh, kilograms applied each cut, and uh, we see that uh, the, the, the crop at, the, at that rate recovered about 60%. At the same total end level with manure, that's this one here, the other red um, at numbers here, uh, you, you only had uh, 42 percent uh, recovered from the, all the end. And uh, what we were able to do with this um, uh, experiment, because it was uh, carried out over a number of years, we could measure the increase or the effect of the uh, fertilizer application, manure applications, on the nitrogen uh, stored and left in the soil. And indeed, we found that uh, a lot, 21% of, let's say, the total N that was applied um, at, at the low rate and 25% at the high rate of manure, so this is 400 total kilograms per hectare, this is 800 total kilograms per hectare, so 20% is, uh, or more is, uh, is still, uh, has been saved in the soil. Um, and that's 20% of the total N. And when you consider that uh, half of the N is readily available, it's quite labile, so this would be uh, about 40% or more of the organic part of the N is still left in the soil. And so by uh, doing a simple uh, subtra uh, subtraction from the total, these two the nitrogen uh, quantities that we know uh, subtracted from what we know we put on, and then there's an unaccounted for uh, amount. And the unaccounted for are those losses uh, that are the holes in the pipe, which are which can be measured, but they're difficult to measure uh, in every trial, and uh, they're uh, difficult to all measure in one experiment. And in fact, denitrification is really difficult to measure. So, uh, but we can get an idea of how much is lost, which is really the key thing, uh, by um, by doing the uh, the balance here. And so, the balance tells us that we have lost uh, more, we can't account for more of the manure nitrogen than, than the fertilizer nitrogen, but we know from other uh, experiments, and some of this will show up later, that uh, the fertilizer is more prone to leaching and the manure is more prone to volatilization. In this trial, we use ammonium nitrate, which is not really prone very much to volatilization, only lose probably a few percent at most. Uh, so most of the losses are likely leaching with some denitrification, and the, um, uh, whereas with the manure, uh, there uh, was less leaching in the experiments that we did. There was some, but not that much. Uh, but we had, um, we had, uh, a, 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 we assume we had uh, some significant amount of volatilization from other trials that we did, not not on this one. So, um, so we uh, we know that uh, there is evidence of uh, nitrate uh, losses. Uh, in, um, in, in the soil, and uh, we've done a couple of uh, few experiments to kind of look at that, in particular uh, wintertime losses. So this uh, very busy looking graph, uh, it's actually not so hard to understand really. Um, what you're looking at here is, an ex is um, a long-term experiment with a bunch of different treatments and different rates which are listed on the side here. Basically there are different fertilizer rates, different uh, rates of whole dairy slurry, and different rates of separated liquid dairy slurry. And the experiment here I'm showing you from 2003 uh, when uh, the experiment was begun all the way to 2010, it's still ongoing now. I don't have the more current data, but what you can see is uh, uh, soil nitrate measurement measured uh, just prior to each uh, manure application or to put it another way, um, after each harvest during the year and at the end of the season. So at the end of the season, I've put circles around. So that's, these are all different years. The dotted lines here represent the new application. There should have been some lines here too. Um, but, uh, so you have, what you can see is uh, over the range of treatments all the way from zero control, which is the green, uh, to the very, very high rates, which is uh, over 600 kilograms of N per hectare per year. Uh, the amount lets uh, that, uh, um, that uh, uh, soil, that false soil test that Dan was referring to, uh, would correspond to this, uh, and the dates, uh, middle of October, which uh, would fit with what uh, Dan was recommending, uh, typically. Um, so uh, you can see that uh, there is indeed some uh, nitrate left in the soil, and it's generally higher than the control, so the difference here uh, in this range here is definitely due to the uh, 
four applications of manure over the season, including the fall application, which would have taken place, uh, say, early September. That's this line here. Okay, typically early September. It varied a little bit, sometimes uh, late, uh, late August, and sometimes in the middle of September. So, uh, and then this is the t zero to 15 uh, inch, uh, inch uh, sorry, zero to six inches, six to 12 inches, and this is 12 to 24 inches. And so there is some evidence of nitrate from the uh, treatments uh, all the way uh, through the uh, through the profile. And uh, the other point here is that it varies a lot from year to year. Most years the concentrations were fairly low, but we had one year when the concentrations were quite high and it was consistent amongst the treatments. So we're quite confident that this data is real. And uh, they, we can uh, discuss the reasons for that. We think it's uh, because there was uh, a, a dry period followed by a wet period and we had a lot of additional uh, mineralization or, uh, or release of nitrogen from the organic fraction in the soil uh, due to a very long, prolonged dry period prior to um, uh, the, 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 the sampling and then the re-wetting of the soil, uh, sorry, the, the dry period and then followed by re-wetting and then, and then uh, the sampling after that. So there's a combination of the treatments plus the, um, uh, the uh, mineralization from the soil also accompanied by less removal because the crop yield was lower that year. So uh, that did not, this uh, data does not show any wintertime data, but this set of samples which we took from the same trial um, showing here again 2008 to 2011, and I've circled the wintertime data. This is just zero to six inch, and it's associated with our nitrous oxide measurements, which I'll show you later. And what you can see here in the black is the control. Okay, so grass with no nitrogen. And uh, even the grass with no nitrogen, the, there is some nitrate. It's not zero. These are not zero values, but they're very low. And every once in a while, they spike up and uh, we're not 100% sure why that is. It could be some um, freeze-thaw cycles going on or, uh, well, we don't really know, but, but generally it's quite low. But you can see that there is a residual effect from the manure application. The green is separated uh, liquid manure and the blue is the uh, whole manure. And the, uh, these are the application rates in terms of available end. The total end in both cases was 600 kilograms per hectare per year against split in four applications. So um, in, in terms of total end. So sure enough, there is a detectable amount of nitrate present in the soil over the winter when it's raining cats and dogs here like it, like it is in, uh, uh, in Puyallup and uh, in Whatcom County. So uh, this can't be just residual nitrogen that's left over. This is new nitrogen that's being released over the winter time. Okay, uh, it has to be that because there's just way too much rainfall uh, to, uh, for that to be uh, just the residual from what was left in the, in the fall. And you can see it varies and it goes down here because uh, probably there's less release going on uh, or maybe the rain is really picked up here and it's caused a greater dilution effect. Um, so there, we do have evidence that the nitrogen is being mineralized in the winter time. The total concentration uh, in the soil here, this is soil measurements, so just to repeat that, um, uh, it, it's, not, it's not high, but it's, uh, it's definitely, um, uh, it's not trivial either. Uh, we have taken uh, lysimeter measurements in this trial. We have not put all that data uh, together yet. I was hoping to have it ready, but it, it's not quite ready. Um, these are less similar measurements that are taken from our other long-term trial, which is the one I was referring to before with the storage of nitrogen. And uh, we do see, uh, this is less similar at three feet, and we do see that um, there are, uh, we do pick up nitrogen from the isometers. And what's interesting here is like this high peak here, which is not, does not always, we don't always see that. But this um, is the uh, manure, and this is the, fertilizer, high manure, high fertilizer, the total amount of available N is the same or similar for both these treatments, but the total N for the manure is actually twice as high. So this has been getting 800 kilograms of total N per hectare per year, not a treatment we recommend or a rate that we recommend, but we want to have that for our, for our experiment just to see uh, how high we can go. And uh, But uh, we almost reach the same level, which is 400 kilograms of of uh, nitrogen as, nitri as, uh, as ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And uh, we often see that uh, in terms of total N, that uh, fertilizer is more susceptible 
than manure to leaching, and part of that is because some of that nitrogen is, is simply not available. But re recall here that this is after many years, so there is some release of nitrogen from the historic applications. So this isn't just from the current, but also from the previous years. This is not our data, uh, and it's not something that uh, we've ever tried to do, but it's very instructive, and it's, uh, I think it's really, really uh, important to, to recognize this. This is a, a study done in Ontario on sandy soil with pig manure, and what they, uh, what they observed there was that if you inject manure on a tile drain field and, uh, and you have heavy rain just after, that within hours, as you can see from this inset here, you start to see the manure coming out of the tile drain. So um, there are cases where uh, leaching can be extremely, extremely dramatic, and, uh, and that's not to be, uh, not to be ignored. Uh, in our trials, in our experiments, we don't have a tile drain fields, so uh, we don't see this, but uh, and the data that I'll talk to you about uh, that I'm talking about today is not um, manure injection the way it is here, although we have new trials now where we are looking at injected manure in cornfields. But that day I won't, uh, I won't be presenting that. So uh, Dan mentioned runoff. I'm going to mention it briefly here too. You can't ignore the fact that if you have a slow field, runoff is an issue. And runoff uh, here are values that we measured in a high rainfall year and a low rainfall year. And of course you get more runoff uh, in a high rainfall year. Um, we found that aeration of the field going across the slope uh, consistently over four years um, uh, did reduce the amount of uh, total runoff and also the runoff of nutrients. Um, the key uh, factor in runoff uh, of nutrients, and this is uh, what our observation was and also uh, reported in the literature, is how much rain you get in the days and weeks that uh, follow after manure application in the fall. So if you go through uh, quite a few weeks without rainfall, then the amount that you're going to lose in runoff is going to be less, quite a bit less, than if the rain happens soon after application. It's sort of intuitive in a way, but, uh, but uh, you know, still it's, it's good to have that um, uh, evidence from, uh, from data. And this is our data, and it's also uh, the data that others have reported. So um, we've been interested in um, losses of uh, nitrous oxide uh, as part of our project and as part of our funding. And uh, it, it's, it's of interest directly because uh, nitrous oxide is important. Um, and also um, because in, uh, the workers in other parts of Canada have discovered that uh, wintertime losses, uh, particularly associated with freeze-thaw cycles, are extremely significant in some parts of Canada in terms of the overall nitrous oxide emissions. So they, uh, on the prairies, for example, they get more quite a bit more emissions uh, of nitrous oxide immediately uh, when uh, spring thaw occurs, they get much more even than when they apply fertilizer uh, in, in, uh, in their spring, uh, to their spring crop. And that's, so these spikes have been quite well documented. I personally don't think they're very well understood, but they do occur. So uh, we were also interested to see if uh, what our wintertime losses are. And uh, this is an example of, of uh, wintertime nitrous oxide emissions. The thing to keep in mind here is that if we didn't have nitrate in the soil, the likelihood is we would have no nitrous oxide emission. So this is indirect evidence that there is an ongoing amount of, of nitrate uh, in the soil and uh, that's being denitrified under the wet conditions that we have in the winter. And uh, when it's being denitrified, some of it goes up as N2, which is innocuous, in back into the atmosphere, and some of it kind of... Uh, um, leaks out as, uh, as nitrous oxide, which is, of course, a, a very, very potent greenhouse gas. So um, here we have um, uh, the wintertime uh, emissions, and this is uh, average uh, over uh, several years and with different treatments. And you can see that there's about a half a kilogram uh, or more of nitrous oxide lost uh, from the applications, uh, following the applications of these different uh, nutrient sources. And this is the control, the, uh, the black here in the corner. Uh, low level, it's not zero, but it's quite a bit lower. So we know that this is not just generated from uh, the soil itself. This is, uh, this is a result of the applications. And it varies a lot from year to year. This is the purpose of this slide, is to show that uh, some years, um, you know, it seems to be fairly consistent, sort of, on average. But then some years you have this huge spike. 
Uh, and that's characteristic of nitrous oxide measurements, and they're not always completely understood why you have such variability in space and in time. Uh, it's, uh, we see here quite often that the whole manure, uh, our nitrous oxide is higher than our separated manure, whole manure higher than separated, whole manure higher than separated. It wasn't the case in this year. Uh, there is a general consistency uh, to the pattern. Uh, these are the low rates compared to the high rates, so that's quite consistent, except here. Um, so in general, there is a, a consistency to the uh, uh, applications. And why whole manure uh, more than uh, separated manure? Well, partly because we had more leaching with the separated manure, so we lost some of the nitrogen that way. And also because we think there's more carbon source in whole manure than in a separated manure. We can't really tease those two factors out at this stage. But, uh, but the difference is not huge. Uh, it's there, but it's not huge. What's a big, what's the bigger difference is the annual difference. And um, so uh, this is a, what we would call an emission factor. Uh, that's what uh, you know, the, the climate change people uh, look for. And typically, uh, for nitrogen application, they say it's 1 or 1.25% uh, of total applied N. Here, uh, we, we get quite low emission factors typically on grass. And this is a wintertime emission factor. Usually, it's for a whole year, but just for the purpose of, uh, of our work. So we find it's about, uh, it's about 10 or 10 to 15 percent, let's say, or, or just about 10 to 12 percent of, uh, of application. And we have here with the fertilizers somewhat higher. Uh, but still, it's quite, uh, it's quite moderate in terms of the overall emission factor. But in terms of percent of the total annual, and this is averaged over several years, uh, we can see that it's about 25 percent, uh, more or less, 20 to 25 percent um, is uh, in the winter time. So we can ignore the winter time, and uh, oftentimes measure, measurements are not taken in the winter, and uh, and that's a mistake. It's a mistake not to take measurements in the winter because things do happen in the winter. Shall I? Uh, curiously. Sorry, yep. this, is, this is Laura. I'm terribly yep. sorry to interrupt you, but if you can wrap up in the next couple minutes so we can save a couple question, minutes for questions, that would be fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'll uh, just shift to the, uh, the, that's just more nitrous oxide. So, uh, I'm going to switch to uh, the other part of my presentation, just a few slides here. And it's about, it. so I'm, I was talking about release of, of nitrogen, and I'm going to talk about conservation of nitrogen. So, um, we find it's a very homeostatic system. Uh, there's, um, uh, we use it, an experiment we did. We applied four applications of fertilizer versus one application of fertilizer. This is, would seem to be a very poor way of using nitrogen. And yet, in terms of our total, this is a three-year average, our total recovery of nitrogen was almost as good with a single application. And so it's led us to really have this feeling about homeostasis uh, in grass system. And uh, this is uh, apparent recovery of fall applied manure and applied either in mid-September or mid-October. And we can see that uh, even uh, the nitrogen is in the herbage and the roots. Often the roots are not looked at. Uh, but there was definitely a significant amounts of recovery of the fall applied manure in the crop itself. And there was also, coincidentally, much less um, uh, nitrogen if you look at perennial grass compared to, say, bare soil or even a, a cover crop in terms of what was left as a residual nitrate at this measurement taken in November. So you can see the difference uh, that the grass makes. Um, so uh, this is, I, I couldn't find the original, the, the, the graph, and I remembered I had it on Farm West. So I thought this was a good way to remind people about Farm West. This, uh, a lot of this data is on Farm West. This is the recovery of nitrogen um, at, in the next, uh, measured in the next year. And we see that 50 to 60 kilograms of nitrogen uh, that was applied in the fall uh, could be accounted for in the roots and shoots of the grass. There's also this little depression here. If you measure here and here, you won't notice that you could have a drop. And this is due to, to freezing and thawing and dying of roots. And so you can have some loss in the winter, but if you don't measure, uh, it will be forgotten. So th and there's also an associated uh, yield increase from this nitrogen. So uh, conclusions, uh, yes, we do have uh, evidence that there is nitrate released over the winter time and that needs to be taken into account. Nitrous oxide is, uh, follows from that, and of course there's issues with, uh, with runoff that one should consider. The grass systems do tend to be um, homeostatic. Um, there's evidence that a lot of nitrogen that could be lost is not lost, even with very high rainfall, 
uh, conditions, but um, uh, there are also potentially losses that we may miss out if we don't sample in the middle of the winter. And the overall conclusion is that um, there's both conserved nitrogen and there's lost nitrogen. Both are true, and uh, both ideas are true. There is the grass system tends to be conservative, but there's also losses. And uh, and in order to match, manage nitrogen, uh, one needs to always go back to the leaky pipe uh, model. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yes. And so what we'll do is, um, Shatai, we'll take maybe two questions. Is that all right with you? Are there any questions sure. for Shatai? Yep. Sir. Shantai, do you have a minimum temperature, the low temperature at which uh, mineralization would cease in your winter studies? So, Shabtai, the, the question is, is there a minimum soil temperature at which, um, you know, this mineralization ceases? So, in other words, formation of the nitrates. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very good question. And if you'd asked me that, um, uh, maybe a few years ago I would have said, well, there can't be very much mineralization taking place in winter because we know my microbes are not very active in low temperatures. But there's a lot of really good research, and there's a nice article in our new book, Cool Forages, from, from Quebec and from Finland, uh, where they've shown that, in fact, uh, it depends on your soil type. So if your soil is, um, is sandy, then uh, when the soil freezes, uh, mineralization will stop. But if you have a lot of clay in your soil, then, uh, mineral, then the, the water doesn't actually freeze. A lot of the water stays unfrozen, even well below zero, because it's uh, partly uh, attached, absorbed to the clay particles, which prevent it from actually freezing. And microbial activity will go on for quite a few degrees below zero. And, uh, and in, you know, they find significant mineralization in, uh, in Quebec uh, City where they have about 10 feet of snow on the ground. And uh, it's really hard to take those measurements, but they've done it. But it depends on the soil type. And uh, so, uh, yeah, and it's uh, the, the thing also to remember, the rates are low, but the period is long. So, um, you know, it, 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 it's kind of a thankless task from a research, researcher standpoint to take measurements which are continuously very low, and people sometimes don't do it. Sometimes it's hard to find significant differences. and. So you just, you just don't do it. But really, uh, there can be significant uh, activities happening uh, at a low level over prolonged periods of time that, that, that add up to, to something that is real. And that's why I showed you that 25% of our, of our uh, nitrous oxide emission, 20 to 25%, happens in the wintertime, which most people wouldn't even measure. And we didn't used to measure. Thank you very much, Shatai. I think we should probably stop now. If you have questions for Shatai, write them down and we will do our best to get them to you.